This video is about chorales. More specifically, it's about Johann Sebastian Bach's chorales, and I talk about why Bach is as important as he is, what chorales are, my experience analyzing all of his chorales, and a whole lot more. This was the largest analytical undertaking for me by far, and I learned a ton while doing it. If you've watched any other videos on my channel before, this video actually is surprisingly only a little bit longer than the average video length, so you're probably used to the longer format. But if you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by, and I hope you enjoy. If you're new to the channel, hi, my name is Forrest, and before I talk about the challenge itself and how I went about tackling it and how involved it was, let's take a moment to talk about Bach. Besides being in contention for one of the best composers of all time, he's one of the first composers we learn about. But why? J.S. Bach is essentially the poster child of a period in Western European classical music called the Baroque era, and although Bach had contemporaries, history shines most favorably on his music. It might be kind of hard to imagine, but there was actually a time where Bach was much more obscure than he is today. The main reason why we know Bach's music can be traced back to a time called the Bach Revival. Another composer you might be familiar with, Felix Mendelssohn, is often credited with making the impact that would eventually lead to Bach's music being spread to the masses. In 1829, at the age of 20, he conducted the megalithic St. Matthew Passion, an incredibly ambitious work for Bach's time that continues to live on in concert halls all over the world to this day. But why revive Bach? Why not Handel, or Scarlatti, or Vivaldi, or really any of Bach's contemporaries? Is it because Bach is objectively the best of the Baroque? Well, many are inclined to answer yes, and here are a few reasons why. A lot of scholars make the argument that Bach's music was the most complex of his time, and I'm inclined to agree. However, it's important to understand that Baroque music is inherently complicated. Music of the Baroque period is at a fascinating intersection in Western Europe's music history. On one hand, music at this point has solidified its harmonic vocabulary and grammar that composers would continue to use for centuries called tonal harmony. These harmonic advancements would make a lasting impact on music, as we even see many of the same characteristics evident in today's compositions and music education. But on the other hand, probably the most prevalent texture during Bach's time was counterpoint, which is a musical style that consists of multiple melodies overlapping to create harmony. This also happens to be the most common texture of music that predated the Baroque period. When abiding by the same stylistic considerations Bach had, composing music was both an art and, as many music students have figured out, a numbers puzzle. And although counterpoint would never fully go out of style, Bach's successors would often opt to use musical textures that weren't strictly contrapuntal. But, after analyzing Bach's music, it's evident that his resourcefulness, his harmonic density, and his ability to masterfully subvert expectations stands out when compared to his contemporaries. Bach was a musical person through and through, and because he was introduced to music from such a young age, he was destined for musical greatness. As a child, he was already proficient as a multi-instrumentalist. He picked up violin from his father Ambrosius, and he also picked up organ from his eldest brother Christoph, all the while singing with his local boys' choir. Bach would grow up to hold several musical careers throughout his adulthood. He'd be a choir director, a band leader, and a chamber musician, just to name a few. But what might be the most shocking is the fact that he was most likely best known for being an organ expert who played professionally and oversaw the building of many organs in Germany, a few of which are even standing to this day. Bach was also known as a music director later in his life, having had stits in Weimar, Kothen, and of course his longest position, Leipzig, where he remained for the last 27 years of his life. 
And while it's easy to look back on Bach's legacy and worship him for his contributions to music, both through his art and his presence, Bach did not live glamorously. Bach grew up in poverty, and although he was able to find musical success later in life, he never achieved a level of wealth that would afford him the comfort most might assume he had because of how commonplace his music is today. Here's an excerpt I found that summarizes his work and life balance very well. Bach was also rooted in the world in a way we all share. He had to work for his living. He had jobs. He had employers. He had conflicts with them. He put out feelers when things became intolerable. He had to feed his family and at the same time satisfy his massive need to create and to innovate. We associate Bach with Leipzig, but it was his worst paid, most frustrating post of a half dozen frustrating posts. Yet he stayed for 27 years. He composed the two great passions of St. John and St. Matthew and a cantata every Sunday for 200 Sundays until he finally got tired and began borrowing and recycling. It's not as if he didn't continue to look around, but stability and security such as it was kept him there. Saying that Bach wrote a ton of music is almost an understatement. Although it's difficult to pin down an exact number, more than 1,100 complete compositions have survived the test of time. I probably don't need to explain how absurd of a number that is, but his total number of compositions just barely scratches the surface of understanding how much music he composed. If you've ever listened to Bach, you've probably seen BWV in the title. This is short for Bach Werke Versichnis, and although there are others, this is probably the most common catalog of Bach's works. It's mostly complete. However, what's handy about it is the fact that all of his music is separated into discrete sections. Some of the sections consist of pieces that are relatively short. For instance, BWV 250 to BWV 438 consists of a large portion of this channel's content, Bach's standalone four-part chorales. But not all of Bach's music is made equal lengthwise. BWV 1 to BWV 224 consists of Bach's cantatas, which are multi-movement vocal and ensemble pieces that could be upwards of 40 minutes long. So even if we estimate conservatively and say that the average length of one of Bach's cantatas is 25 minutes, if you multiply that by all 224 pieces in this section, that is 5,600 minutes, or a little over 93 hours of music. And that's just the first 20% of Bach's surviving work. Bach wrote oratorios, and he wrote masses, and he wrote passions that easily take at least two hours each to perform. And the crazy thing is that that's just his vocal music. Bach has an extensive catalog of purely instrumental music as well, but that's beyond the purview of this video. The point is, Bach wrote loads of music, and even though it took me the better part of 18 months to analyze Bach's chorale harmonizations, they only make up a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of his total output as a composer. A chorale starts with a melody, more specifically in Bach's case, a hymn. Bach was a Lutheran, and although singing is common fare in church settings regardless of denomination, the chorale originated when Martin Luther was completing his original translations of Latin sacred songs to German. And for some, the definition of a chorale stops here. The congregation and the choir sing the melody together, much like how religious music is sung today. But in Bach's case, the melody would be the source material that would further inspire a harmonization which is a process that involves taking the melody and supporting it with a harmony underneath. In virtually every case, Bach would harmonize these chorales in four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. A composition would result in each beat of the melody having its own prescribed harmony, leading to a texture with an exceptionally rapid harmonic rhythm. I'll get back to what this means later. As I mentioned before, Bach wrote a ton of chorales, some of them standalone, and some of them as movements of larger works. But despite making up a slightly significant portion of Bach's total catalog, chorales are still a cornerstone of the Western music theory curriculum. This is BWV 316. 
And for the record, I could have picked any corral. This was just a random page I plucked from my notes. The first thing to take into consideration about a corral is its texture. For the most part, it's homorhythmic, which means that all the voices have the same rhythm. Now you might be thinking, Forrest, the rhythm is not the same across all the voices. Look at all of the different things they're singing. But the rhythm is straightforward. It makes focusing on the harmony much, much easier, unlike in a piece of more rhythmically complicated music. Like one of Bach's fugues, for instance, where rhythm can make picking out chords very challenging. The texture also impacts the rate at which new chords are introduced. This is called harmonic rhythm, not to be confused with the rhythm I just mentioned. In most music, it's common to see moderately paced harmonic rhythms. Perhaps we see one or two chords per bar. In some cases, we might even see one harmony implied over multiple bars. However, in the case of Bach's chorales, a new chord is introduced every single beat. That's a rapid harmonic rhythm, which means that a short chorale that might take 30 seconds to perform might introduce as many chords as you might encounter in a work that lasts several minutes. Getting a new chord every beat is a workout for someone studying harmony, and if you want to learn about someone's harmonic practices, chorales can be a great resource because they're both compact and harmonically focused. And with that being said, what most would probably argue to be the biggest takeaway from analyzing or harmonizing a chorale of your own is voice leading. Voice leading refers to how harmonies move from one to another. When we first learn to spell chords, we usually spell them in some type of musically alphabetical order. C-E-G or A-C-E. And this is true with inverted chords and extended harmonies as well. But when you look at chords in actual musical contexts, you'll often find that not only are chords capable of being spelled in any order, but also each note in the chord doesn't have to move the same distance. In fact, most of the time, you'll be told that the best way from one chord to another is coincidentally the smoothest because it will involve the least amount of movement of each voice in the chord. So like looking back at an instrumental example, it can be much more difficult to see voice leading practices when they're buried in a rhythmically complex texture. That isn't to say it's impossible, but a lot more effort goes into it. And although I don't care for terms like best and good when talking about music objectively, especially when talking about theory, learning about common Western voice leading traditions is definitely a great way to get practice thinking about and manipulating chords. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I started this channel on January 4th, 2022, but the idea for the channel happened a couple of months before. New Year's resolutions are really important to me, and after having finished my master's a few months before, I started to miss the analysis I would do for my classes. So as a New Year's resolution, I set a challenge for myself. Analyze one piece of music every day for an entire year. But after putting more thought into the challenge, a couple of potential hurdles started to emerge. Was I going to look at a different artist, or was I going to look at the same artist? Was I going to look at a bunch of different styles, or was I going to look at just one style? And as I kept thinking and thinking about it, it made more and more sense to use my time to really get to know one particular artist as well as I could. But the problem with that is that there aren't too many composers who have pieces that I could analyze one day for a year. Sure, Beethoven wrote like 700 some odd pieces, but I can't analyze an entire symphony in one day and do it the thorough justice that I wanted to. So my options were limited. And then it hit me. I remember browsing the internet for some Bach a few years ago when I came across this. 389 chorale harmonizations and you could probably see where I'm going with this because 389 is so close to 365 I thought to myself this is it this is too perfect and fast forward a few weeks to the beginning of 2022 I create a YouTube channel I learn how to record myself and I start plugging away at this collection of chorales things however began to get rocky pretty quickly in fact, I was in for a rude awakening after analyzing only the third chorale in the collection. At this point, I was developing my early video style. 
I was printing out the corral, which is actually something I would do for the entire length of this series, but I was literally cutting the corral out of the collection. It wouldn't be too long before I started printing out the corral as its own score. However, the problem lurking under the surface had nothing to do with how I presented the score. It had to do with the title. If you look at this collection of corrals, it appears as if each harmonization has a title on top of it. And after analyzing the corral, compiling the footage, and editing the video, I had to give it a title. Now up until this point, I knew about Bach just as much as any music student who took a Western European music history class knew about him. This means that I was familiar with the BWV collection that I talked about earlier, and this got me thinking, why is there no collection number next to the title? At the time, this wasn't an issue. I just googled the title, I found the BWV number, and I thought I'd be good, right? For starters, let's talk about discrepancies in how Bach's chorales have been titled. There are two ways of titling the chorales, by getting the name from the text, or by getting the name from the melody. Sometimes, these are both the same, like in the case of my first and most popular video about BWV 269, but I would come to learn that Bach used the same text and the same melodies a lot. And the problem with this is that it becomes a challenge to know which chorale is which if so many of them have the same melody. In my earliest videos, I would just Google the title from the 389 Chorales collection that I found online, and because the titles they used were based on the melodies, I had to check across so many different chorales comparing them against the chorale I analyzed for the video. And at this point in this video, I have to give massive props to Enrique, one of my earliest supporters and commenters on the channel. Without you, I don't think I would have ever figured out the title situation, amongst other things. But after about 75 episodes, I decided to bite the bullet and look for another solution about finding chorales starting from their BWV collection number and not their title. And honestly, without having to do too much research, I happened upon the holy grail of a resource that would provide me with guidance I would need to continue along with my journey, the Bach Chorale Table. It appears that this table was put together by Luke Don in 2018, and it's a compilation of all of Bach's chorales by BWV number, text title, melody title, and a ton of other useful information. Like for example, which chorales are harmonizations of the same melody, information about the first performance if any information exists, and probably the most important tidbit, the fact that there are way more than 389 chorale harmonizations, if only I had this at the very beginning. But, as a wise person once said, better late than never. And I continued my journey finding new trends and developing my analytical style along the way. There were short videos, and there were long videos, and there were medium length videos in between. Making videos for the channel had become a routine part of my day, and when the journey was over, I was honestly emotionally overwhelmed. I was relieved to have some of my free time back, uh, I was happy that I had finished my goal, but I was sad that there wasn't any more of Bach's chorales to analyze. But you know what? Here I am with new musical knowledge and experience under my belt. Bach was virtually always a composer of tonal music, which implies that his music had key. Now, if you're watching this video, you probably already know what key is, but for those of you who don't, all you need to know is that a piece's key describes the central pitch it revolves around. Key can stay the same, or it can change in a variety of different ways. Like if we take a look at the circle of fifths, we can see that we get 15 unique major and minor keys before they start to become overly redundant due to needing more than seven accidentals to spell their scale. Now during Bach's time, this was even more limited because of the tuning that they used called mean tone temperament. And without getting into the math of it, the tuning system aimed to make major thirds sound purer by reducing the distance between the perfect fifths. So keys in and around C major sounded in tune for the most part, but the further away you strayed from C major, the more out of tune you would sound. This is a byproduct of many historical tuning systems, and Bach would display his advocacy for equal temperament, or in other words, equality between all keys, in his well-tempered clavier. But how is this at all relevant to the chorales? 
Well, after looking at all of Bach's key usage in the chorales, you find that keys in the top half of the circle of fifths are heavily preferred. And although these keys are the most convenient due to their lack of accidentals, tuning's effect on perception of certain keys could be a motivating factor as well, especially in the case of chorales that are accompanied by instruments. So during my research, I kept track of two different sets of data, overall key and keys explored. With overall keys, most often the case is that the key that the piece ends in is the overall key. So if you want to have a little bit of fun, pause the video right now and leave a comment if you want to guess which overall keys are the most common and the least common. Of the 418 chorales I analyzed on this channel, the most common overall key is G major. It's the overall key in about 59 chorales, which is roughly 14% of the total number of chorales Bach harmonized. Second and third place are a close call, with G minor being the overall key in 47 chorales, and A minor being the overall key in 45 chorales. Now for the least common key, which might be a little easier to guess. The least common key is A flat major, occurring only once as the overall key of a chorale. Honorable mentions go to F minor and B flat minor, which both only occur twice as overall keys. Now for total key usage. Now this was a bit trickier to track for a few reasons. First is interpretation. There are quite a few instances where the harmony is a toss-up between multiple keys, usually two but sometimes more, and if we take a look at how that appears in my notes, I put down the analysis I stuck with here and the possibility of another key in parentheses to the right. But for the most part, I was able to make a strong enough argument for one key for it to be the most likely analytical outcome. But for the sake of reflecting the analysis I stuck with, I'm going to leave out instances where I'm on the fence about a modulation to another key. So with that being said, as you probably already guessed, the most common key in box chorales is G major, with approximately 285 total occurrences. Second place goes to C major, which occurs approximately 250 times. With all this key data, I think the biggest takeaway is the distribution of which keys are most likely to occur in comparison to their placement on the circle of fifths. Not only is there almost a complete lack of representation of overall keys in the bottom half of the circle of fifths, but the majority of the concentration of Bach's tonality is focused in the top quarter of the circle of fifths. One thing I didn't expect was G major being the overall most used key. I expected it to be somewhere near the top, but not the most common in both categories. My suspicion was C major, which is why I'm surprised it's closer to the middle of the pack regarding overall representation, even though it makes up more than 10% of all of the keys across box corrals. And like I mentioned before, it's a bit easier to guess the least used keys because they're generally more obscure in the first place. In a three-way tie for last place with one occurrence each, we have G-sharp minor, G-flat major, and E-flat minor. G-sharp minor is a bit of a surprise because B major is a key that, you know, despite not seeing a ton of use, is still somewhat relevant. But G-flat major and E-flat minor are not surprises at all, as they occupy the bottommost slot on the circle of fifths. I imagine chorales with keys like these would be incredibly difficult to accompany with instruments due to the tuning conventions of the time. As you probably already know, a modulation is a shift of key. Bach modulates in virtually all of his chorales, and he does so in two ways, using a common chord between the two keys and directly modulating to another key. Common chord modulation is exactly what it sounds like. Bach moves from one key to another using a chord that the two keys have in common, but sometimes when the keys share multiple chords, it could be difficult to know exactly where the modulation takes place. In the case of a direct modulation, there isn't any setup. One key will move to another abruptly, whether it's in between a section or in between a phrase. Modulations are another aspect of analysis that leave room for interpretation. Of the two types of modulations Bach uses in his chorales, 
common chord modulations are far more common, but by how much? Well, like I just said, some modulations leave room for interpretation, and this is especially the case when Bach moves between relative keys at the beginning of a phrase. Let's say, for instance, we look at the transition between these two phrases from BWV6. Of the two phrases we're looking at, the first ends in the key of B-flat major. However, on the pickup of the next measure, we see a D major chord, which implies movement to G minor. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can go about analyzing this. However, I think that the modulation happens at some point around here, in the space between the first complete measure of the second phrase. With that being said, we can agree that the analysis I decided upon in the video originally, which involves B flat being reanalyzed as three in the key of G minor, being accurate. But you could analyze this as a direct modulation as well, where the second phrase is its own harmonic idea removed from the previous. In my opinion, either analysis is correct, and whichever analysis I decided to use could depend on a variety of factors. It could depend on the day, or it could depend on other features from the same chorale. Either way, it's difficult to pin down exactly what type of modulation is occurring in certain instances, which makes exact numbers not entirely possible in my opinion. But with that being said, of the approximately 2,065 modulations that occur over all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, only about 190 are direct modulations. Now this number could vary pretty wildly depending on your style of analysis, but regardless, I can say with certainty that the vast majority of the modulations in Bach's chorales are common chord, and a large reason behind this is because they occur somewhere in the middle of the phrase. Unlike how we use the word cadence to describe someone's inflections when they speak, in music, a cadence refers to the ending of a phrase. In music of the common practice period, cadences are typically defined by their harmonic components. Cadences function a lot like punctuation does in writing. Some cadences might sound more conclusive, while others might lead you to believe that there's more music on the way. While studying music of Bach's time, cadences are commonly grouped into four categories. Authentic, half, plagal, and deceptive. Authentic cadences consist of a dominant functioning chord resolving to the tonic, and are further categorized based on how the melody resolves. Generally, they're considered the most conclusive. Half cadences are almost the reverse of an authentic cadence consisting of a chord resolving to the dominant. Because of the unstable nature of the dominant, these cadences typically imply that there's more music to come. Plagal cadences are a stable type of cadence, typically consisting of the four chord resolving to the tonic. And although the phrase ends with the tonic, the absence of a dominant functioning chord usually ranks it behind the authentic cadence in terms of its conclusivity. And lastly, the deceptive cadence consists of the dominant resolving to a non-tonic chord, and this chord usually is six. These cadences subvert our expectation for the dominant to resolve to one, and are usually used for suspense, but also variety. So now that we know about cadences, let's talk about the breakdown. In the chorales, there are approximately 2,540 total cadences. In my analysis, I found that there were 47 cadences that were either ambiguous or not analyzable using conventional means, so I subtracted these from the total. But to be fair, the majority of these cadences were analyzed in my earlier videos, and this isn't meant to discredit them in any way, but I did get into a definitive rhythm by the time I was about 75 videos into the series, which was the point where my analyses started getting stronger. Now, if I were to go back and reanalyze these, there is a chance that I would just choose a cadence and roll with it, but throughout all of my videos, I mention cadences that are on the fence and talk about them at length. So regardless, here's the breakdown of all the cadences that I analyzed. The most common cadence with a staggering 53% of total occurrences is the perfect authentic cadence. And I assume that this would be the case namely because it's most common for chorales to end with a perfect authentic cadence, meaning that every chorale statistically is going to have at least one. The second and third most common cadences are the half cadence and the imperfect authentic cadence. 
In my hypothesis, it was a toss-up between these two for second and third place, but either of these would make sense because they're common complements to the perfect authentic cadence, especially when talking about form and melodic structure. However, on the topic of half cadences in particular, I tracked occurrences of a special type of half cadence called the Phrygian half cadence. They occur when there's bass movement from flat 6 to 5, which means that they most commonly occur in minor, and these alone occur more frequently than plagal or deceptive cadences. And because they are a type of half cadence, they boost the half cadence occurrence rate up to nearly 28%. Plagal and deceptive cadences are the least common, with roughly 76 and 46 occurrences each. The low occurrence rate of deceptive cadences makes sense, after all, if deceptive cadences were too common their effect wouldn't be as impactful, but with plagal cadences I'm actually a bit surprised by how infrequently they occur. Plagal cadences are sometimes called amen cadences because of their usage in church music, and considering the vast majority, maybe even all of the chorales composed by Bach were for liturgical occasions, you might assume they would be more common. Now that the journey is over, I feel like I've learned a ton about Bach, about music, about study habits, and maybe most importantly, about myself. As far as Bach is concerned, he really was ahead of his time. He pushed boundaries in harmony, in dissonance, and in harmonic density that have led theorists and have led musicologists to devote their entire careers to studying his music. And to think that I spent the last year and a half looking at a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of his work makes me feel kind of small, but at the same time, it makes me feel even more amazed by the fact that there is so much detail and care that goes into every single chorale. Bach was more than just an artist, he was an artisan. And although his music is formulaic and he is resourceful, Bach's music had societal function. The same way that a baker would bake bread, or how a carpenter would build a home, Bach wrote music, and the extent of his musical output is a byproduct. But beyond talking about Bach in particular, learning about one composer's music in so much detail has been the most meaningful application of my theory background that I've ever done. You see, most music students learn music in a survey style. They usually use a textbook and look at examples that prove the narrative that the author is trying to convey. And while this is good for laying a foundation, it has potential to do a disservice to the student by teaching them that music is honestly like sterile and law-abiding. If something comes up that wasn't covered, the student isn't taught to be okay with the fact that there isn't an answer. The music's breaking the rules, but they don't know how to handle that. And in reality, there aren't strict rules the majority of the time. Composers just wrote in a style that felt natural to them. And one of the benefits of studying one particular composer is that a lot of the analyses that stumped me at first were answered after learning that it's just something the composer does, and it's something that they repeat in their own music. After learning to relinquish the need for an answer in your analyses, you learn that you haven't been learning about music theory after all, and instead you've been learning mostly about musical conventions. I've learned that music theory is about questioning possibility, and a lot of the times, even though there is a clear-cut answer that doesn't leave any room for debate, there are just as many instances where there are several analytical outcomes that can explain why something works. This journey also reinforced my belief in consistency over quantity. If analyzing every chorale was the only thing I did with my free time, I probably could have analyzed all of them in a month or two, but in the interest of retention, spacing a goal out over a long period of time is better. The most common thing I get asked by my students is, how did I learn how to analyze? And the only honest answer that I can give them is that I analyze often. And maybe my brain is wired for music, and that's why I get so much joy from it and why I've pursued it to the extent that I have, but my musical journey has been much more about the time I've spent studying music than it's been about my talent for music. And if there's anything we could learn from Bach's story, it's that achievement is often a result of repetition and consistency. Taking on a project and finishing it is a challenge that so many people can commiserate with. 
Whether you lose motivation because you don't like where it's going, or whether you incur burnout because you bit off more than you can chew, if you're looking for a reason to see something to fruition, just know that finishing it this time might be difficult, but after a while, getting to the end of a project is going to be normal for you. And remember, not everything you create has to be perfect. Of course, everyone's path is going to be different for more reasons than I could possibly think of, but something that everyone who has passion for something has in common is that they're consistent in their pursuit. And for me, my pursuit to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations has been incredibly satisfying, and I hope that I was able to help, teach, or maybe even entertain you along the way. And with that being said, as I sign off all of my analyses videos, thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you take care.